And so now we'll basically discuss how, at a kind of a conceptual level, how genome-wide association studies are conducted. And so some basic uh, terms or uh, dichotomy to genome-wide association studies are, ne are needed here. So when you perform a genome-wide association study to identify SNPs associated with some uh, phenotype, how you perform those analyses kind of depends on what your phenotype or your trait looks like. And so generally speaking, if you are looking at binary phenotypes, so that's those are cases where like case control studies, where you have like, you can divide people into a healthy group and a not healthy group, um, like say normal or type two diabetic, then uh, typically you're using tests like Fisher exact test or tests like that. Um, that essentially looked at the distribution of people with a genetic variant and how that uh, relates to the distribution of people who have a given trait. Uh, in contrast, when you are looking at continuous phenotypes uh, like BMI or height, um, or even for, for example, uh, traits like or diseases like type 2 diabetes, uh, you, some of the uh, measurements that people use to determine whether you have diabetes might be continuous. And so uh, you might try to do a genome-wide association study against a continuous phenotype, which is indicative of, say, type 2 diabetes. Then those kind of association studies basically amounts to fitting the lines. And so we'll talk about what that means exactly. Uh, but we'll start with binary phenotypes because those are, um, those essentially are what case control studies are. And those are kind of what you might classically think about when you think about uh, genome-wide association studies. And so we already saw examples uh, of how Fisher's exact test is done in the context of gene set enrichment analysis, for example. And so here I'll just kind of briefly go over it again in the context of genetics. And so here the idea is that um, suppose that you have uh, 2,000 individuals that you're studying the genetics of uh, some binary disease phenotype of, and you are, and you, uh, these 2,000 people are divided into 1,000 cases and 1,000 controls. And now you want to ask the question, if I am looking at one particular SNP, say a biallelic SNP, in which you only see an A or G uh, across your 2,000 individuals, and you want to ask the question, is one of these variants associated with, uh, with this particular trait? then what you would do is you would again build one of these so-called two by two contingency tables where every individual, every case and every control that you have genotyped basically has either an A. So suppose that we're looking at a uh, haploid genome for the time being. So every individual in your genome uh, or in your study has either an A or a G at a particular SNP position. And so among your cases, you can divide your cases out into the people who have A or G. In your controls, you can divide out uh, your individuals into those that have A or G. And in doing so, you can build this two by two table where you can see that the rows of this table each sum to 1,000 because there's 1,000 cases and 1,000 controls. And you can see based on the number of people who have A's or G's that A is a what's called a minor allele. Um, it's, it occurs at a lower frequency in your population or in your study population than G's. And so if you ask the question, uh, you know, which is, is there an association of either A's or G's with respect to uh, your cases? When you look at this two by two table, you can see that essentially because the rows sum to 1000, then you can easily kind of see the proportion of cases and proportion of controls that are basically uh, have the A allele in. So you can see that basically 24 over 1000 uh, is the proportion of controls that have A and 68 out of 1000 is the proportion of cases that have the allele A. And so basically the uh, A allele is present in about two and a two and a half times uh, higher rate in the cases than in the controls. 
And so intuitively, you can see that uh, if there's kind of no errors in the study, and we'll talk about what those errors could be in a second, then the ALDL was found at a rate of, you know, two and a half times uh, higher than in the controls. And so, you know, there, there possibly could be an association between an ALDL at this position and uh, the whatever phenotype you're looking at. And so if you were to do, for example, a Fisher's exact test, uh, you know, where you pretend you have an urn and you have colored balls, just like we saw with the gene set enrichment analysis test, then you would find that your p-value is something really small, like 7.3 times 10 to the negative 7. And so there, uh, if there's no errors in your study, then you could uh, conclude here that there is strong association between the A allele in this position and your case status. And so here's just uh, a more mechanical uh, illustration of the urn, urn example, uh, just like for gene set enrichment analysis. And so I won't go over it here because you can go back to the gene set enrichment analysis lecture and review it if you uh, don't remember how this works. But essentially some terms that I want to re-emphasize here is that the p-value, which we said was about 10 to the minus 7, is calculated based on these simulations where we're drawing random groups of 1,000 uh, individuals and asking how many times we saw an A. Um, and that's a distinct concept from effect size, where effect size basically just asks, in, in some intuitive sense, what is the relative rate of, what is the relative proportion of people with the allele in the cases versus controls? And so that's really just 60 over 24. And so that effect size is approximately 